what I tell folks who are a little earlier on, I'm like, do it now. Like, it's so horrible to do it later. Just take a little bit of pain now because how disruptive it's going to be if you're if you are where Box was, 1,500 employees, and not having kind of your shit together there. It's going to be so problematic. Just do it now when you're, you know, Series A maybe and like 100 employees. Like, it's going to be so much less painful to get some sort of structure now than doing it in two years when like you have to unwind a bunch of legacy crap. Today's guest, Marie Gasset, has an impressive track record building growth programs. She led the launch of Box's product-led motion and helped Confluent commercialize its open source developer community. But none of that growth came easy. On today's episode, she shares refreshingly transparent lessons and challenges of leading these growth initiatives. Welcome to Grow and Tell, the show where revenue leaders tell the growth stories behind successful companies. I'm your host, Alex Krakow. Marie Gasset had a unique start to her time at Box. Coming out of Stanford Business School, she took part in a rotational leadership program where she worked on finance, sales, and growth teams. Out of that came the creation of Box's online sales business unit, where Marie led a cross-functional initiative to add a self-serve motion to complement Box's traditional sales model. After six years at Box, she spent two years as Confluence VP of Growth, where her main focus was marketing to their thriving open source developer community. Now, she's head of go-to-market at Column, a bootstrap bank slash software company that helps developers build financial products. In today's episode, we discuss the growing pains of building Box's self-serve program, selling to open source users at Confluent, and early growth lessons from Column. I hope you enjoy the chat. I'd love to start today's conversation talking about your time at Box. You joined Box after you graduated from Stanford Business School, and you started at Box with a rotational leadership program. Can you talk about what it was like to participate in, in the in the program? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was really cool, actually. Um, I think those these types of programs are typically, um, I think, a lot of marketing, but the substance is kind of crappy. It was a really cool opportunity. I basically spent two and a half years popping around the company, three different roles. Um, I did work on Box's IPO, which I had no business being a part of, but it was so cool. Um, focus a lot on customer economics, which is great in that kind of IPO function and then in a kind of sales strategy function. And then I worked on kind of a new online sales self-serve initiative, which was, um, I think was probably one of the coolest experiences of my career. Um, and kind of got me interested and got me plugged into kind of like the growth space. So yeah, it was great. So, because you eventually ended up picking kind of like online sales product management as like the focus out of that rotational program. Like, I don't know, you mentioned it was cool. Like, what was so interesting about it to you? Yeah, I think like I realized being close to revenue was what I enjoyed and what was what seemed to me to be one of the like most interesting and valuable parts of the business. Um, what I didn't like was kind of this like kind of old school, no offense, Oracle sales motion that I had seen in kind of B2B SaaS. And online sales seemed like, okay, you're close to revenue, but you're data driven, you're close to the numbers. And that just felt like a perfect match. And then the idea of like, Fox was not a small company. And the idea of being in like a growth area building still was really appealing. Um, So yeah, it was great. And from my understanding, I think one of the first things you did once you picked that focus was to kind of put this like data infrastructure in place to sort of measure the impact of self-serve and just to kind of monitor the program. Can you talk a little bit about like, why did you focus on the data infrastructure to start sort of as opposed to like running a bunch of programs to try and drive more, more self-serve signups? Yeah, I wish it was, um, I wish it was a function of like me being very smart and having a ton of foresight, but honestly, the current state was so bad, like we had to do manually manual recon at the end of every month to actually know what the revenue numbers were in self-serve. So like that, it just wasn't even an option not to invest in the numbers and in the kind of tracking data infrastructure. We wouldn't even know if we were doing something right. And so we were almost like stuck. It bore like so many, so much fruit down the line. Like if we hadn't spent all this time, like first getting our act together from a data infrastructure standpoint, it would have actually slowed us down like so much, you know, a year or two later. And so 
now when I do kind of like share thoughts and best practices on a growth motion or a self-serve motion, I'm a little like obsessed with the tracking piece because I saw like how valuable it was and how horrible and like worthless all your efforts are going to be if you don't actually like take the time to to measure it. And it's not sexy and it's not like fun. Um, but it's like, it's the only way. What like size and stage was Box at the time? Do you remember like how big the company was or even revenue? Like, cause it's, it's so yeah. interesting that, cause I'm sure it was pretty big, but like it didn't have the stuff in place. Yeah, we were probably a, over, definitely over like a couple hundred million. We were public. We probably were like 1500 employees. And I think there's like the infrastructure the team had on like, you know, Salesforce tracking, for example, for the sales team was good. And there's decent like product analytics. But because the self-serve motion had been neglected or not really, you know, important for a while, there was just absolutely nothing there. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty dire. Uh, it, was, was, it wasn't great. Yeah. And I always think people always say it's like really hard to kind of, if you do the top down sales motion, it's always really hard to kind of go back and do PLG and, and you know, and Box pulled it off, but it makes sense why it's so hard. And, and data infrastructure is like a, I don't know, a very good example of, of like the tedious work you have to do to kind of go back and, and make that happen. Totally. But what I, what I tell folks who are a little earlier on, I'm like, do it now. Like it's so horrible to do it later. Like just take a little bit of pain now because the like, how disruptive it's going to be if you're if you are where box was 1500 employees and not having kind of your shit together there like it's going to be so problematic like just do it now when you're you know series a maybe and like don't have you know have 100 employees like it's going to be so much less painful to get some sort of structure now than doing it in two years when like you have to unwind a bunch of like legacy crap yeah. It's a good reminder. I need to do my stuff at a dock a little bit better. Like we have some infrastructure in place, but definitely, definitely can, can be improved. But, you know, it's always hard. It's like, all right, do you focus on the core product or totally. do you focus on the tracking? And it's, totally. you know, there's trade offs and, and everything. Do you, do you remember at the time, like, um, what sort of the North Star metric was like when you're building out this data infrastructure? I mean, I assume like revenue is a big component of it, but like what other things were you sort of thinking about tracking as you kind of built, built out the infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, our our North Star was definitely new ARR, so like new recurring revenue, so much more on the acquisition or the expansion side. We weren't thinking about churn, which we can talk about. It was kind of stupid, but, you know, we weren't for a while, for a couple of years. Um, and then we kind of had a cascade, right? So there's like new ARRs and North Star metric. And then what are all the pieces that like feed into that? And all the way down, you know, furthest away from revenue, you're going to have like maybe like ad impressions or unique visitors on the website and then signups and then, you know, conversion to paid and then expansion. Um, but we really were pretty focused on backing out of the revenue metric and not being, not getting too cute with like, no signups, we're going to optimize for signups. Okay. Well you can like cheat your way into getting like a hundred thousand signups that are worthless. So let's always anchor on revenue because you can't get too, you can't get too kind of like cheap uh, when you're focused on like the, the like ultimate metric that matters. Makes sense. Was there a specific like um, product activation goal or like aha moment you were trying to get people to, to push towards? You know, we had, um, we definitely had like a threshold of activity like that someone does during a trial that we wanted folks to meet in order to, you know, be, be much more likely to convert. I will say, like, we really did struggle to, to drive like early onboarding activity and early adoption. Like if I, if I reflect and I think, Hey, what are the projects that were like amazing and what, from an impact standpoint, and what are the ones that we just never quite like figured out? I would say like early activation onboarding, we never found like obvious or quick fix. And maybe that's a signal of my, my impatience, certainly at the time. But, you know, it was it's like, getting people to use your product is not something you can like, just, you know, have a better button, or, you know, a slightly better flow, like, that's, that's deep, and that's pure, and you have to like, really invest. And one of the 
maybe shortcomings I had was like this impatience that was much better, much more satisfied by like a new pricing page or like reducing friction and sign up. And the onboarding, the activation stuff warrants this almost like really like academic, patient, like pure initiative that for some reason we never totally cracked when, when I was there. I'm sure folks who's followed me did a much better job at it. It is such an interesting thing. And I'm dealing with this at Doc too, because like we get people to use the product and they self-serve and they start playing around and building workspaces and stuff. But then, you know, there's moments where people get stuck and I'm like, why do they get stuck? And it, I think what I've learned is it's not even about the product itself and like clicking the buttons. It's about like the business outcomes that they're trying to drive. And it's like, it's hard to set up an onboarding program and they get slowed by kind of the internal processes and like the things around the product. And like, that's really hard to think about and push towards as you think about like, self-serve motions. And that's why like, I think sales assist stuff is getting even more totally. popular because that can help like push some of those more business outcome things when you have the, the self-serve side. Totally. I think there's actually, I sometimes think of like the evolution of growth or like self-serve or online, whatever we want to call it, PLG. Like the focus has just shifted over time, right? There was like maybe like five or seven years ago, right? Like we were all in this mindset of, you know, if you have some great like product tutorial at onboarding, like it'll solve all your issues. And then I think we like optimized as much as we could and realized, all right, we've like hit some like diminishing returns. Now we have to move on to like another lever we can pull. And to your point, I think sales assisted is now, now kind of the thing of like, okay, this is the next lever that can actually get impact, but it's going to look a lot different than like, you know, a cute tool tip in your, in your product dashboard. You eventually built like a cross-functional team. I think it was called like the online sales business unit to kind of like work on self-serve program. And I thought that was super interesting because the stuff is super cross-functional. Can you talk a little bit about like who is on the team and kind of what that collaboration looked like? Um, yeah, that this this part was awesome. Like this part, I think we got right at Box. We, and this was my boss's doing, he kind of insisted and forced like the executive staff to like put money where their mouth was. Okay, you want to do this initiative, you want it to be successful. It hasn't in the past, you have to dedicate resources, you have to like ring fence teams to do this. And so we built um, a business unit that had Eng um, systems, which I, it took me a while to realize how important that was, but basically making sure that like all the systems are talking to each other, a big part of kind of like the data infrastructure piece. Um, product analytics, we had design, marketing, and then we'd like support, you know, from finance and other functions as well. But yeah, that like bringing together of all those functions, like all focus on the same thing meant we actually got shit done. Like it was pretty awesome. Um, and then don't get me wrong, like we didn't start with all this, like this big fancy team, you know, we started with like, I think three eng, me on product and like someone helping on systems, we had a few like wins that then, you know, we were able to make the point like, okay, hey, let's bring in like even more kind of functions to, to move even faster, have more impact. Can you talk through kind of like an example project that, that you all worked on together? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the, the um, like wins we had was on like an, an upgrade flow. So like, how do we, you know, we have a lot of folks who maybe converted a trial, maybe they're paying us like, $500 a year, not a lot. Like, how do we get them to upgrade? Um, that was super cross-functional because obviously there's like a huge eng component, a big um, product component, um, design on how we're going to, you know, what the, the UI is going to look like, how do we measure everything. So that one was pretty cool, especially because there were so many pieces to it. It wasn't just a flow. It was like, how do we show value in the product of things that users don't have access to yet? So, you know, we were like, you know, kind of previewing like, hey, here's an insights tab that like, you know, you could access, but like you'll need to upgrade. And then we had this really cool upgrade flow. Um, so that was one one of the projects that I thought was um, was really cool. Everyone was kind of involved in it and it happened to like work really well, which was which is always great. That's awesome. That's really cool to be able to like tease out the features that they could be getting and to kind of provide a little bit of value, but not too much that they got to, you know, pay pay an upgrade. And, I, and I've heard you also talk about like pricing pages like how do you think about good pricing page design and how does that you know impact like kind of the, the self-serve experience yeah um i am a big fan of like the pricing page as a lever 
in large part because we had such success. Like we launched a new pricing page um, early on in kind of this business unit. And we saw literally overnight the run rate in, increased by two and a half million. It was unbelievable. It was like, I, I couldn't, it like defied um, what I thought was reasonable that like mainly a UI change could drive folks to purchase more. That's when I started to buy in and like, oh my God, like this stuff is real. Like you can improve some experience, some UI and actually get like millions of dollars. It seemed crazy. Um, uh, so yeah, that was in large part kind of a design change, frankly. I think the other thing we learned there and that I, I still feel pretty strongly about is transparency, like pricing transparency. If people want to buy it, let them buy it. Like don't force people into trial if they just want to buy it. Don't like force people into an annual commitment. Like if they don't want to offer, you know, maybe a slightly more expensive uh, monthly option. And so that's kind of like a tenant I still hold today of like when in doubt, be transparent, be flexible, you know, set expectations. Um, you know, I'm not always right. I'm learning as, as you know, I'm, I'm in a much more upmarket space now. And some of those like principles are being challenged a little bit. Um, but I certainly think like in the SMB space and the self-serve space, like you can never go wrong by just being like upfront. Yeah. I'm curious about the sales team who usually wants to hide pricing. Like how did Box's enterprise sales team kind of interact with the self-serve program? And because I imagine you sort of had these two different motions. There's the self-serve, you know, motion, and then there's this more sales led model. Like how did they interact with each other? Um, Initially, very poorly. Um, one of the first initiatives we did with the sales team is we, we basically like took away credit. We're like, Hey, you are no longer getting paid on, you know, like trial conversions that you can't prove you helped. So we basically took out, I think 20% of their quota attainment on, on the like SMB side, less, much less so on the enterprise side. So it was very bad. Um, initially, um, I think what a, we kind of changed kind of how we thought of how sales gets credit for, for things that come online that then that smooth things over a bit. And then we really got in the mentality of like, our job is not just to, you know, hit these revenue numbers, but like feed the sales team. So like we have to, everything we do, we have to, you know, come to the sales team and say like, Hey, here's this, here's how it's going to help you. Here's how you can like leverage, you know, this, all these new trials you're getting to hit your number. Um, but yeah, it was not good initially. Uh, we ended up actually moving the business unit to report into sales at one point as a way to try to kind of like smooth things over. It's like, hey, sales, the sales leader has to own, you know, the AE driven sales and has to own online sales. And that way we can like force us to like get along. And it, it did work, actually. Did you have like a concept of like product qualified leads or something to pass over these, these, these like, you know, good opportunities to the sales teams or sort of how did, how did the, you know, flag good accounts to the sales team? Yeah, totally. We worked with the analytics team. We did a pretty basic like analysis. Hey, what are the signals that we're seeing in kind of like a self-serve trial or like a small deployment that signal higher potential? So we used, you know, found what those signals were, used them to trigger like a notification to the sales team to say, hey, this one looks high potential. It's worth your time. Um, I like to think it was PQLs before PQLs um, were a thing. Um, but yeah, that helped get us, you know, get us kind of credibility and good goodwill from the sales team because we really did try to say, hey, you know, this can help feed you. And we, we tried to actually like serve them up, you know, trials and self-serve accounts that that had the ability or had the potential to, you know, have a meaningful impact on their quota. Yeah. I mean, it should be a good thing for the sales team, right? Like getting warm leads who are already interacting with the product. I mean, that's like a sales person's dream. You know, I always think of like the best relationships as sort of like an alley-oop, right? It's like marketing and growth, like tosses up the lead and then hopefully uh, sales can kind of, kind of slam, slam dunk it, right? A uh, bad analogy, but you get the idea. Uh <laughs> I think, I think that I, I agree. I think like where rubber meets the road is like what people are getting paid on, right? That yeah. all sounds good until in our situation, we basically were paying on something and literally took it away overnight. Um, and so it all like should work. But then when you're kind of messing with people's livelihood, like people rightfully get, get pretty mad. 
Yeah. No, and it makes it something that's like good for the business because you have to like pay out comp a little bit totally. less and automate it. But yeah, it's worse for, for the salespeople. But I think, you know, they, they adjust. Do you, do you remember like how the sales folks would reach out to these um, leads? Like, was there a specific hook or something to get customers to, to respond? I wish I had like a sexy answer to that, but no, like discounts. Yeah. Discounting and then like, hey, we can, we'll like help you. Like, hey, we at least you'll have like a person on the other side of an email or the phone that will like, you know, answer your questions and things like that. So it wasn't super thoughtful, but it worked. I always thought, and I think this is true, like Box was like this enterprise solution and then Dropbox was happening at this kind of roughly the same time and was the self-serve version of the same product. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about like Box's efforts to kind of, I guess, compete directly with Dropbox in that segment. Is that kind of how you thought about it internally? Was this kind of a direct effort to kind of go and try and eat into what, what Dropbox was doing kind of at the low end of the market? Definitely. I think the other piece was just, even though we were strategically more focused on enterprise and certainly a lot of our product decisions were guided by that, we actually, a lot of our revenue came from an SMB base, you know? And so it was a little bit more like, hey, we have a lot of revenue coming from down market we can actually do way better in this part of the of the market by just like doubling down on on these efforts. Um, so I, I, you know, it was a little bit more like, frankly, it was driven by um, how inefficient we were from a sales and marketing standpoint at the time. And we were kind of running around thinking, okay, how do we a like spend less? So self serve, no commission. And how do we make more money? Duh. And like, we actually thought, okay, this is a pretty crappy experience in self serve. And we can actually, you know, probably double our money here by putting a little bit of effort. So it was really driven by that more than kind of a direct like Dropbox competition play. Gotcha. Makes, makes total sense. Um, all right. Let's switch gears and start talking about Confluent, where you went after Box, where you joined as like the VP of growth. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, paint the picture of what, what Confluent's product actually does and kind of what was it like when you joined? How big was the team? If you remember rough revenue, curious what it was like. Yeah, I think so. Team wise, I think we were like 600 employees um, above 100 million. I don't remember exactly where. Um, also, pre IPO, we ended up going public, I think about two years um, after I joined in, in mid 2021. Um, and the company very different, um, certainly than that when I experienced at Box. So open source kind of commercialization product. So basically this open source um, software called Kafka. Uh, which is focused on like how you stream data. So basically a, like a new way of thinking about, you know, data going from one place to another. Um, huge adoption in the OSS like space. So tons of developer adoption. And basically Confluent was the commercialized version. So you're using Kafka, you need help or you need more features or, you know, you want all to unlock all these other capabilities and then you would buy Confluent. Um, in order to access that. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was very cool. Like definitely a little bit of a chasm between this, like very developer friendly, like OSS facing part of the company that was all about adoption of Kafka, this thing that we, you know, didn't make any money on. And then a pretty traditional, like sales motion, pretty upmarket, initially very reliant on professional services, which was not great. Um, so definitely like a little bit, it was hard to reconcile kind of those two different parts of, uh, parts of the company. Yeah. It sounds like you almost had like two different cultures, you know, totally. it's like this, like free open internet side, help the developers that it's like, all right, your hardcore SaaS, uh, sales enterprise folks is very, very different. Totally. Like, how did you bring people over from that kind of open source community to the, to the paid side? Like maybe we'll start at the top of the funnel. Like what did kind of outreach look like and how did you kind of get those initial at bats with, with kind of folks? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing, and this was a big learning, the biggest thing, the basis of like what was successful from a growth demand gen pipeline generation standpoint was basically saying, finding people who were using Kafka, the underlying open source, and then pitching to them, here's how that can be improved, made easier, made cheaper by working with Confluent. Where we misstepped um, pretty meaningfully is, you know, data streaming, it fe real time data, like that market is infinite, right? You could be like, oh my God, like our total addressable market is 
enormous. Let's find all those people who could benefit from real time data and like, let's sell Confluent to them. And what we realized fairly quickly was if someone's not already using the open source software, like our conversion rates essentially are zero. And so we're spending all these resources trying to convince people that like this like new way of looking at data was like, you know, the the best thing for their business. Come to Confluent, we'll like take you on this journey with us. And what we we realized was like it's that's too that's too much of a jump. Like what we really needed was kind of a two prong approach. One is like this great developer advocacy group that's like super developer focused, just focused on Kafka adoption. And like in the purest, you know, most like developer friendly way. And then kind of the like marketing and sales team's job was like, okay, once we have this like addressable market of Kafka users, then let's show them, you know, the value of going from using Kafka to like working with Confluent as well. And it took us a while to figure that out. Um, And it took us a while to kind of like, I think bring, we actually, we, there was no desire to bring the developer advocacy group more to be more commercialization focused, but at least bring the sales team and the marketing team a little bit more to like appreciating that, like the foundation of everything we do has to be usage of, of Kafka, the open source. Yeah. It's super interesting. And a good lesson around like, uh, how, how a niche, you know, works, right? Like, you know, you're trying to spread the word around, you know, the, the big idea that Confluent was trying to solve, but it actually worked better when you were just focusing on just the people who are using Kafka and then moving them over. And you mentioned like that two prong approach. Did you focus on both of them or, did, or you were more just on the marketing and sales side and trying to bring the Kafka users over to kind of the commercialized side? Yeah, more so on the, on the commercialization side. So we, one thing we, I think, you know, JR CEO did really well. So he kind of like siloed the developer advocacy group and like let them do their thing and not be kind of poisoned, frankly, yeah. by the sales and marketing team. And so, you know, we were just kind of there like waiting for the Kafka community to expand and then seeing how we could a- uh, action that. I-, I think that was a really good decision and kept it pretty pure. Um, so yeah, I was just on the greedy, greedy monetization side. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's the side I would be on too. Uh, yeah. And then what does it actually look like to kind of bring people over and like sift through the community? Are you just looking through like GitHub and seeing who's really active and open source and who's contributing the project and things like that? Or yeah, how did how did that sort of go to market motion work? Yeah, essentially like the the biggest successes we had were, okay, what are scalable? So obviously not like clicking around, you know, a community, but what are scalable ways to identify what we called Kafka signal? Like how do we find what are the ways that we can identify that a company, a persona is using Kafka and then market to them, usually more so um, technical personas? How do we market to them like, hey, here's how your life or your job or your outcomes can be better by using Confluent? And so examples of that, you know, we use like LinkedIn skills a lot because people would talk about Kafka as a skill they had. We used job postings you know, scraping job postings to identify if they were using Kafka at an organization. Um, And then through a number of channels, you know, ads, SEM, um, sales outreach, et cetera, we would target them. But again, another kind of mistake we made is getting a little too, in my opinion, uh, this was not everyone's belief at Confluent, but we were, we got a little cute and kind of, you know, trying to go after these more senior business-like personas you know, like, oh, we're going to, you know, really pitch them like the dream of how digital transformation will change everything. I always found that like really getting it like, hey, a slightly more senior technical persona was like, and the conversion rates, you know, agreed, was kind of the way in to, um, to starting kind of a deal cycle and getting, getting pipeline generated. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was, not everyone agreed with me. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I'm sure like the technical folks like really feel the pain of using Kafka and the open source technology and then really feel the benefit and the value that Confluent was providing. Whereas like the other style messaging is more pie in the sky and like harder for people to kind of grasp like, wait, what are we actually buying here? Digital transformation sounds cool, but it's like, okay, what's the problem you're going to solve for me right now? Uh, Totally. it sounded like you built an SDR team, right? To kind of go out and reach out to those folks. Can you talk about like kind of that that process and, and what, what that was like? Yeah, I mean, we had, so we had a pretty traditional, initially a traditional SDR team. We had an inbound team. 
um, that was focused on ingesting leads and converting those. And then an outbound team that worked, you know, across like with the sales team and outbounded into into key accounts or priority accounts. So that was not anything revolutionary. What what I thought was cool is we also built like a sales assist team. Um, so we called them cloud SDRs uh, as we were really trying to push the kind of Confluent cloud product. And their role actually was kind of bridging the gap between, you know, the developer advocacy team and then the more like commercialization team in that, you know, we really look to them to be super helpful, not salesy at all, and be focused exclusively on adoption. Um, so, you know, their key metric, at least when I was there, was, okay, how do we get them to activate and use the product, regardless of whether they're going to, you know, monetize or hit a certain threshold that's worth much from a from a dollar standpoint. Um, so that was kind of uh, the first foray into like a very, felt like a very pure, um, like sales assisted motion. Would you comp the SDRs on the product activation metrics? Yeah. 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 So, gosh, and I'm forgetting the term. I think we call it production activated orgs, POWs. Yes, PAOs, production activated orgs. And that was the North Star. Like how many folks who sign up for Confluent Cloud can you get activated? And that's the goal. And we're not, and that you know, that was some cer- a certain threshold of usage, but it was not linked to pipeline. It was not linked to um, you know, a certain monetary value. It really was, you know, we're trying to increase the base of folks who are using our cloud product in like some sort of regular, you know, monthly active or whatever way. You touched on this a little bit before, but like, how did you think about the role of search in the growth program? You know, like both paid and organic, because I imagine you have a dev- lot of developers out there who are using the open source stuff and looking for improvement. And that probably feeds really nicely into kind of a, a search program. How did you think about it? Totally. Yeah, our search program was great. We had a um, a great person leading it on the team. Um, we saw a ton of success on like branded search in that we we kind of said Kafka was was part of our, you know, part of our brand. And yeah, we saw a ton of success there. I mean, I think the the foundation of that is obviously the the structure of the search program was great, but the foundation of that was like the amount of content that we had. Like we had on the on the organic search side, but also just in terms of, you know, providing content for the paid search side and all kind of our paid programs. We had we had so many Kafka like technical experts and they produced so much like gold. And so we had so much content, like honestly, a lot of what we did was on technical SEO, like just making things sure things were like appended the right way or organized the right way. Um because there was so much like valuable content in our docs, in like all sorts of materials, uh, white pages, whatever. And so the foundation of it and what I tell folks often is like invest in content, but don't do kind of like BS, you know, kind of like shallow content that's going to, you know, maybe come up on a Google search, but not actually provide value. And so it made our lives so much easier on the, you know, kind of like acquisition, what we call digital growth side, because there was like a plethora never ending amount of content that we could just like adjust a little bit to make it, you know, more lucrative in terms of getting, getting folks into, into the website. Do you remember how you went about creating kind of that more technical content? Cause it's, it's hard, right? Like, you know, we're talking about Kafka and like, I barely understand what that actually means, but you know, I can write. And then the people who usually know the technical stuff, you know, are maybe, you know, don't have time in their day to write or aren't good writers and don't want to create content. Like how did you sort of bridge, bridge that that gap at Confluent and kind of create that more technical content? Um, we actually were pretty lucky in that we just, because it's a very pretty technical product and that there was this like group of focused developer advocates really focused on writing content related to Kafka, the open source. Like we had so much to work with. We did have to hire like technical writers to, you know, put content that was going to help like bring people into the ecosystem. Um, so we, we did some of that, but we were really lucky that it was pretty natural to the business to just have a lot of things written down about Kafka, which is what folks would search and look for. And so it made it so easy for us to be like the number one destination for anything that's kind of Kafka related. It was almost a no brainer. Like if you want to look anything up about Kafka, you're going to come to the Confluent website. And imagine how easy then of a jump it is to be like, oh, hey, by the way, if you have any issue with Kafka or any, you know, aspirations, like we're the folks that you can come to. So that, yeah. that was awesome. 
it's almost like it's a content marketer's dream because it's all just totally. so naturally down funnel. You know, it's like we're thinking of all this stuff at Doc to write. And, you know, there's like these, you know, more top of funnel keywords like sales or B2B sales, you know, which are hard to go after and, and don't even provide that much value to us. But like you have so many different avenues where it's like very down funnel and it's an easier conversion. So, yeah, that, that's cool. Would love to switch gears and talk about Column, where you are today, which I think is a really interesting company. Can you talk a little bit about like what is Column? Why did you join? Who's the founding team? How did you kind of get involved over there? Yeah, totally. Column is so different than um, than anything I've done before. So, um, and it's I I still you know almost two years in struggle to, to like properly explain what we do, but essentially we're a bank um, and a tech company. So any kind of company that wants to operate a financial product. So if you think of Chime or even Robinhood, any like move money movement, if you think of bill.com, like anything that involves like moving money, holding money, lending money, you have to actually work with a bank somewhere in your stack. Like you cannot do that if you're not working with a bank. And the current ecosystem is horrible. A bunch of legacy banks that, you know, have no idea what it means to work with with tech companies. And so William Hockey, our, our founder and CEO, he was a co-founder at Plaid. He kind of identified this opportunity. So he bought a bank and then built kind of from scratch a banking core and kind of APIs to plug into bank, basically the banking, the financial system. And so we work with fintechs, with payment companies, with insurance companies, with kind of any company that's doing any sort of financial capability and essentially are kind of like the infrastructure stack for them. Um, and uh, yeah, so different. Um, I think it, I, I certainly, I think I joined Column out of like a slight existential crisis around like the idea of doing kind of the same growth playbook for a different company, a different product gave me like existential dread. And so the idea of doing something totally different, uh, smaller um, with, a, with like a proven founder and a great team, I was just like, you know, you gotta like take a swing. And it's been awesome. It's been really great. Yeah, and it's way more early stage than the other companies, right? I mean, you joined, how, how many people were at the company when you joined? Oh, gosh, maybe 30 or 40. Yeah, maybe, maybe less. Yeah, it's so different. But I think, you know, one of the biggest learnings I've had, because I haven't hadn't gone so small before, is like, I don't think I realized how much, like, my soul was getting, like, sucked out from like the corporate kind of like BS, some of the politics, I you know, you inevitably are involved with at, the, at a bigger company. And I think when I started working here, I was like, wait a second, I work a lot, but like it feels light because most of my energy is focused on just like doing stuff and like moving the ball forward versus like 80% of my job being focused on like getting ready for e-staff or like arguing with some director of sales around like their pipeline targets. And so uh, that's been like incredibly rewarding. I'm sure I suspect you might feel the same way too. Yep. Pretty much as soon as Lattice got, you know, big, I was like, okay, I'm going to go quit and start a company and go back to, to super small. Uh, but it's funny. I mean, it's good. Like there's pros and cons to both sides, but I find it, uh, it never gets easier, but the work changes. And like, I enjoy doing like real work myself as opposed to like managing always through through people although i realize like hopefully as doc is successful i will have to manage through people because that's what a ceo does so it's i don't know it's a funny funny balance but i guess i'll always have my weird side projects that i do myself is kind of how yeah, I, and I, I think, think about it i think what i'm learning here at column what i think william has done a good job of is you know we're now a hundred people i think and yes still small but like there are ways to grow and to have you know the the org expand and not kind of get this like political dynamic or this like these inefficient bureaucracies. Obviously that at some point you get to a thousand people, like it's almost impossible to fully avoid. But I think there are ways if you're like really disciplined, really transparent to actually have a company where like, okay, you can scale a good amount without being, you know, being this like big corporate bureaucratic nightmare. Yeah. The crazy example that comes to mind is like Amazon's pizza teams, you know, where it's like, all right, you should have a team that's the size that was like two pizza boxes they can they can all eat, which, you know, I'm sure Amazon is very bureaucratic and corporate, but you can tell like they, you know, they're tried trying. to hold on to, they're trying at least, which I, which I give them credit for. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about like Column's growth strategy? Like, is it a very small ICP, like very defined, or is it wider than I think? Because in my head, it's like a very small group of people who would buy Column services, but maybe I'm I'm wrong about that. You know, I thought so too, and it is wrong. So we, you know, I, I joined thinking, okay, we're basically selling to fintechs. That's not that, you know, large of a market, or at least it's a large market, but the ICP is fairly focused. And I think what I've found is, and it's it's a blessing and a curse, is actually we, because we're like infrastructure, financial infrastructure, our TAM is enormous. And I think that's great as a shareholder and whatever. Uh, it just means it's hard to focus. We've found that, you know, the most innovative fintech companies we can are an ideal customer, but also these like legacy insurance companies, like they have super complex payments and a lot of pain associated to that. And so, you know, I will say it's a struggle to really like narrow in on the ICP because we're, we find pain that we can solve in so many different kind of company profiles. Um, I think the, the way we focus right now a little bit is like we are, you know, a premium solution. And so, you know, our, our deal sizes are fairly big and that's a little bit of how we frankly like filter and qualify. Um, and I think what we're also trying to do, which, which can be hard is just like, we're early, keep an open mind, you know, there's obviously a balance between we want focus because that's going to allow us to execute really well, but we also still need to approach kind of go to market with a lot of curiosity so that we don't come across an account and say, oh no, they're not, you know, they're not our ICP, but we say, okay, well, are they? Oh, wow. Okay. All of a sudden we uncover like a whole new segment of the market that could be extremely lucrative. And so for me, that's been a little bit tough to uh, to really keep that like open mind, and that curiosity, because I'm tempted to like do the go to market thing of like finding the ICP, focus on it, execute on it. But rather like, OK, we're still learning. We're still kind of expanding. Um, and uh, hopefully that's what gets us to, you know, be an incredible hundred billion dollar company. Uh, but it's definitely like a, a give and a take. Yeah, you need to have like two sides of your brain working at the same time. It's like you got to execute to hit the short term numbers, but then obviously keep keep experimenting. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense. Like increase. I assume you have like some minimum or something to make sure that, you know, I, there's supposed to be so much noise of like all the fintechs startups who have just raised a ton of money and maybe want to use it, but don't want to pay. And so, yeah, like a, a, a juicy minimum uh, contract size probably feeds out a lot of a lot of the noise, which is. Very yeah, helpful. but it's yeah. it's tough right because we want to work with the most innovative like newest companies too and so that's hard to focus as well like gosh the idea of like the coolest new fintech like you know that that we might price them out like that doesn't feel right either so um yeah. anyways we're still kind of figuring out where uh you know where our icp is going to be yeah, the thing we did at Lattice was like, you know, we had minimums, but then if we noticed that somebody like a company was a grower, like they raised a bunch of money or something like that, like Cruise, I think was a good example of this, where they started really small and then ballooned to like a thousand employees. Like, but if you can catch those growers early on, it's yeah. huge. Like those are the best ones and they grow up with you and they'll never rip you out because it's just like part of, of, of the story. Um, yeah, super interesting. So is it more of like a enterprise sales motion? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think, again, part of what drew me to Column was there are still, again, is both, right? Like, this comes from, I think, William's DNA and a lot of the folks who joined the company. Like, we still want to be the, like, most developer-friendly, you know, banking, financial infrastructure company out there. So, like, our, I think our docs are amazing. The tech is amazing. We try to be extremely friendly to developers who, like, have questions, you know, want to play around in Sandbox or even... You know, we often um, will, you know, allow folks to open a, a bank account just for themselves or their company and play around, like see what it's like to move real money with Column. Um, so we still have these like very developer friendly uh, roots, but the deal cycles are very enterprisey, you know, six, seven figure deals, more involved, very complex. Uh, so again, I'm finding myself like at the trying to marry kind of those two those two motions. But I, I think maybe that's what, maybe that's what I like most, right? I think the idea of being at like, just doing kind of the Oracle, like big enterprise sales stuff is just, I just can't get on board with that. And then kind of fi trying to find that marriage of like, so developer friendly, great product that the user actually values. And then the like, you know, enterprise sales motion that warrants these giant deal sizes, certainly, 
you know, feels great as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the best go-to-market motion. I mean, it's the same thing I'm trying to do at Doc and it's what worked for Slack and Twilio and all of these companies, Confluent and all these companies, right? You have this self-serve that automates sort of the low end of the market and is like a lead gen for the rest of the business. And then you have the big enterprise sales assist motion, which closes those big deals. So like, I mean, it works like it's worked for a bunch of companies. I'm sure it'll work for, for Column too. Like, um, I guess maybe one last question on, on Column is like, it's a super regulated industry, I imagine. Like it's in banking and it must be crazy to like go buy a bank charter. Can't believe William did that. Yeah. Like what's it like operating in a regulated industry and kind of how does that impact your growth strategy? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the like polite answer is, you know, a regulated space is a competitive moat, you know, so like it's regulated. People don't really want to be in a regulated industry. It's really hard to acquire a bank and that competitive moat is incredible. Um, and so you know, every day I'm thankful for it. The less polite answer is like being regulated sucks. Like it was new for me. So I stepped in, I was like, oh my gosh, we have amazing product market fit. You know, this is a game changer. Well, you pay for it by being regulated. And so it wouldn't allow us, I think, to be as aspirational and successful as we've been if we weren't regulated because we wouldn't have that moat. But, you know, it just means like documentation and you know, thinking about risk and how you mitigate risk and thinking about, you know, this stakeholder that has never been part, at least of my career, which is the regulators. You know, you have customers, you have employees, stakeholders, you know, maybe investors, um, which we happen not to have here, which which is great. But now there's this other like giant stakeholder in the room, which is the regulator. Um, And so that's been an adjustment for me. Um, And we, we hire a good amount of like tech folks. And that's always an adjustment of like, oh, wow, okay, this is you know, a whole new element that we have to take into consideration. And so it's like when you're building the product, there's specific ways you have to build the product to comply with laws. Is that kind of how it plays into the picture? So that definitely plays into the picture. That's not the hard part, uh, or at least it's not the part maybe that I think about every day. But every customer that we bring on, the banks take on risk. Anyone they work with, they take on a risk that they have to mitigate, document, So every time we bring on a customer, we're not just trying to sell to them, you know, show how much value we can provide, but we also have to be thoughtful of, okay, what is the risk we're taking on with this customer? How do we mitigate that? What is the due diligence we do? And so for me, it was like such a change in uh, like my operating model. I spent my entire life thinking about generating demand, you know, getting people to buy. And then here there's some of that. But there's a lot of like, okay, now I need to qualify really carefully and mitigate and like make sure we set expectations and due diligence. And so it's um, it's just kind of flipping it a little bit on its head in terms of like the things we we think about. I guess it's like intellectually challenging, but it's it's different. Yeah. So I imagine it's like the know your customer stuff that yep. like I have to do when I exactly. create a bank account. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like, it's like qualifying actually is really important. It's not just like ways to get good customers. It's like legally important. Yeah. Very, yeah, very I interesting. Mean, yeah. 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 It's in, we make it part of everything we do. We're always thinking, okay, it's not just, this could be a great customer. It's like, okay, well, do they have, you know, the processes in place to stay compliant? Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. I know we have like a few cannabis companies who use doc and like, yeah, I imagine like those companies, I don't know why they would use column, but that they probably couldn't, right? Because of all those. Not, not yet. Yeah. Not yeah. yet. Yeah. But yeah. maybe one day. One day. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I'd love to end today's conversation maybe on a little more personal note. Like you've had a lot of amazing growth over your career. You kind of went from like a B-school rotational program to being a VP of growth at like a couple awesome companies. Like How have you thought about kind of scaling yourself along the career journey? I think my a couple big learnings. I think one of the biggest ones is there's nothing better for your career than being at a company that has great product market fit. And I know that sounds kind of VC ish, um, but I think I have I think I'm great. Sure. But I think I've had a lot of luck in terms of like being at companies where people want to buy the product. And it turns out that like nothing replaces that. And that's like the, the best thing to optimize for, I think. Um, So that's definitely big. Um, I think the other learning or, you know, you know, key kind of like maybe best practice, like hiring people that are better than you. I think we like learned that in B school and I didn't really get it. And then now I get it. And I'm like, oh yeah, like only way to scale is to hire folks who are like smarter 
more thoughtful, better than me and who will like remind me of it every day so that I hopefully I can get a little bit better. The other piece that's been a learning for me at Column in terms of like kind of maybe more tough moments or uh, more recent like big learnings is like you have to learn the product. I think if I'm very honest, I kind of got a little I got away with it at Box. Box, not a super complex product, but certainly at Confluent where I got away with like knowing just enough to like, you know, have productive conversations. And when I joined Column in such a like complex system, the financial system, payments, you know, I, I had a, a pretty like tough come to Jesus of like, oh, I can't like cheat here. I can't like be cute and like know just enough. And so for the really the first time in my career, I had to go like really deep into the product and really, really know and understand the market in a way that was frankly pretty humbling. And so that for me has been like maybe a mid mid career uh learning of like don't don't cheat don't like try to you know just be lazy like you certainly can't do it in these like complex spaces and then my ability to be helpful as like a sales leader or you know a a go to market leader now is because I did the like the real work and so I wish I had I wish I th- internalized that earlier in my career well, thank you so much for an awesome conversation, Marie. If people want to follow up with you, reach out, have specific questions, where where should they find you? Um, LinkedIn. Um, God, I wish I could say like Twitter, but no. Yeah. LinkedIn works. Just LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. That's a wrap on another episode of Grow and Tell. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, or find every episode at growandtellshow.com. I'm your host, Alex Krakov. Thank you for listening.